There has been a lot of talk about critical metals. The European Union and the US Department of Defense have listed those metals which they believe are critical. Critical metals are defined as those metals where our dependence on them is high for the future of our survival and the continuation of our modern way of life, though there is a risk to supply. In some cases, the US and the EU disagree over those metals which they deem critical, but they do agree that the following materials will become highly scarce from 2015 onwards. These include cobalt, fluorospar, magnesium, rare earth elements, tantalum, and tungsten. Common to all of these minerals is the following key trends. Number one, normally they are dominated by a single supplier or country, mainly China these days. With two, under development and under investment in the development of new projects as well as technical expertise in recent years. Three, limited ability to substitute these materials. Four, Increasing number of applications in modern devices and generally critical for portable devices. Number five, generally these have applications in military or defense and therefore is of strategic importance to countries. And number six, either there is a finite or dwindling resource or resources are challenging to extract or unavailable in economic quantities. With that being said, we will provide a high-level overview of the tantalum, tungsten and rare earth markets as recently these commodities have gained considerable investment, investor interest. We will discuss the main drivers of these elements and what characterizes them as critical. I also welcome you to access our website or our YouTube site if you want to download more information on these or other materials. In each case, I want to share our opinion on supply and demand and those factors which could influence these markets going forward. So let's start by looking at tungsten. With respect to supply, in the 1990s, China flooded the tungsten market with material, driving the majority of Western producers out of the market. In the late 1990s, the dot-com bubble, which led to lower prices, the majority of Western producers elected to exit the market. Consequently, global supply is now dominated by China. Moreover, in recent years, demand has outpaced supply, necessitating the sales of stockpiles held by the Chinese, Russian and American governments. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, from 2000 until 2011, the U.S. state stockpile fell from around 35,500 tons to 7,500 tons. As the chart below indicates, since 2008, prices have improved, though the market continues to rely on China. As with many commodities, China has continued to uh, put measures in place to consolidate or control its domestic production, mainly through the implementation of export quotas. And this is very clear in the charts that follow the financial recession. Prices have risen from around $250 per tonne to around $450 per tonne, mainly on the back of restricted exports from China. China now accounts for over half of the world demand and is forecast the growing consumer. Sorry, and is the fastest growing consumer. The country is therefore going to continue to take measures in order to ensure its own domestic needs are met. This has placed unprecedented threat on the tungsten sector outside of China, which presents enormous opportunities for the development of tungsten ores, concentrates and intermediary products outside of China. However, resources are becoming depleted. Within China, new capacity is merely replacing older mines or and deposits which are depleted and therefore the risk of China being able to flood the market as they did in the 90s is now minimal. Outside of China, major producers are unwilling or unable to increase production to any major extent and the largest producer outside of China, Katung in Canada, has only three years life of mine based on existing resource figures. With respect to Chinese supply to the rest of the world, since 2006, Chinese consumption has risen faster than its ability to export, and it is evident that the Chinese outlook for the tungsten sector is on a downward trajectory. Based on China's decision to limit exports to the rest of the world, we estimate that the primary tungsten market is in deficit, and this year we will expect the deficit to be in the order of 15,000 tons. 
Aside from the expectation of a deficit market, there are a number of other factors that are expected to continue to drive demand and price. These include the following. Firstly, tungsten is an industrial material and therefore closely tracks GDP growth. Since China is the largest consumer and accounts for around 55% of overall demand, tungsten demand closely tracks G China's GDP. Second and third largest consumers include the US and the Europe, accounting for 13 and 12% respectively. China's GDP, whilst it is expected to slow, is still forecast to remain around the 7.5% level over the next five year years, according to the IMF. Secondly, with respect to production costs, mines in China are getting deeper, labor costs are expected to increase, as well as taxes and general inflation is high. All this should drive production costs northwards. And thirdly, the number of new projects and capacity expansions is less than 5% globally. In China, the highest capital costs and rising tax are rendering it difficult to open new mines. Finally, whilst the export quota in China is expected to be reduced, the export costs are expected to increase in order to mitigate government losses. Turning our attention to the tantalum market, the tantalum market differs from the tungsten market as the reserves are widely dispersed across the globe. Though since 2009 over 50% of the world's tantalum supply has originated from Africa and a significant portion is said to come from artisanal coal tan mining in the DRC. This is problematic as the US implemented the dog Frank law three years ago which is an attempt to stop conflict minerals. This law necessitated that end users show provenance of their raw materials and prove that these were not extracted by illicit means. To date, however, much of the legislation has not yet been implemented. Though we note that one of the key risks to the tantalum market is that 16% of supplies estimated to originate from artisanal mining activities, whilst a further 23% originates from the conflict area. As with a number of minor metals, new technology leading to the miniaturization of electronic devices which have become smaller, lighter and with more processing power have resulted in increased uses of tantalum. In particular, tantalum-based capacitators are on the rise as they are used in automotive electronics, mobile phones, personal computers and wireless devices. Capacitators now account for around 60% of consumption compared to 51% in 2004. While growth in tantalum demand has become relatively lackluster over the last 15 years or so compared to other metals in the electronic sectors, the cobalt part of our presentation showed that the potential of these devices and automotives, which could, in our opinion, lead to threefold growth from 2007 levels. As with tungsten, um, supply was always supplemented by government stockpile sales. But since 2007, there has been no sales from the U.S. Defense Logistics Agency, or the DLA. Furthermore, tantalum was also supposed to be retrieved from tin slag, but this source has been dwindling since 2010. In terms of tantalum tradability, tantalum is not traded openly, and therefore the market has always been subject to large swings in over and under supply. Mostly tantalum is sold under long-term contracts rather than the spot market, which has traditionally resulted in preemptive buying. During the tech boom, a large number of inventories were stored up by companies on the projection of higher demand for their products, which drove up prices. This was then followed by the tech bubble and the 2008 economic recession, where each time companies were caught long on material. For this reason, prices do not always immediately reflect the supply and demand deficit as consumers have purchased either long or very short. Looking at prices, tantalum prices have been exceptionally volatile, increasing t during times of tech booms or relative conflict in the DRC, which we have shown is a major coal tan producer, and then decreasing rapidly during times of recession or poor demand. At the end of 2010, spot prices climbed almost threefold to around $550 per kilo in 2011. Tallison, the globe's largest tantalum producer, who had suspended operations in 2008, began to open re operations again, selling at a contract price of around $300 per kilo. 
These prices entice other players, such as Noventa and, me, and, and Mybro, to start production. Though again, consumers were long on the material and prices then declined to around $200 to $230 per kilo. The DRC conflict in late 2012 then again drove the market to a high of around $520 to $530 per kilo as consumers were concerned about supply. From the second quarter of this year again, demand started to slow following lower growth in China and the elimination of a number of government-led subsidies on consumer items and again prices began to fall to around $500 per kilo. Therefore, the question of gauging a long-term stable price is challenging. But if we consider all known future capacity expansion projects, it enables us to draw conclusions regarding the future supply and demand of the strategic metal. If we assume a conservative steady growth rate of consumer electronics in the coming years of around 4% compounded annually, then the market will be in perfect balance. Growth above 4% will result in a supply shortage by next year, and we therefore assert that prices have now bottomed out and should start reflecting our expectation of a market deficit. Finally, I want to briefly touch on developments in the rare earth market. I won't spend a lot of time on this as it the amount of media coverage in this market over the last few years has been overwhelming, but I would just point out a few issues and similarities to other critical elements. As we are now well aware, um, though the, through the immense media attention, China controls around 90% of rare earth production and accounts for the majority of its consumption. Moreover, since the late 1980s, all Western rare earth supply ceased, with the exception of some Russian inventory and go or government-held stockpiles, and China became the sole provider of global rare earths, as well as, well as the nation with the most technical expertise in this respect, um, especially when it comes to extraction and separating the individual rare earth elements from their ore bodies. Since 2010, China reduced their export quota by 40% in an effort to preserve their local demand, as well as encourage downstream high-tech production in the country. To this end, China has promoted increased production efficiencies through the imposed mergers of smaller companies with larger companies in an effort to create mega-corporations with increased control over production and prices. The final vision of these mega corporations is to ensure that, these, that in each case these corporations were also significant downstream manufacturers. Just two months ago in May, China established the Guangzhou Rare Earth Group through the integration of 12 key heavy rare earth producers and can now boast as being the largest heavy and medium rare earth producer in the world. Also in May, the China non ferrous South Rare Earth Company set up a 7,000 ton per annum separation plant, which is expected to commence with its maiden production, with its maiden production by 2015. The response to China's strategy by the rest of the world has been a coordination of legal action with Europe, US and Japan bringing China before the World Trade Organization as well as government stockpiling and the provision of a number of incentives to, to develop substitutes or recycling units. Japan earmarked a trillion yen for the development of recycling and substitutes to rare earths. Additionally, there has been a lot of support and funding to sourcing and developing alternative non-Chinese resources. To date, the number of advanced projects outside of China total 51 in 15 countries with a total resource of 7,143 metric tons and a total rare earth oxide content of 40.2 metric tons. Despite these projects, the issues currently facing prospective producers is the capital requirement and technical expertise required to separate the rare earths. In order to circumvent this, there are a number of countries, South Africa being one of them, looking into the feasibility of providing a centralised refinery. Despite the main challenge at the moment uh, the co is that the companies are able to extract a mixed rare earth, cons uh, rare earth oxide, but they wish to understand whether they could develop a marketable mixed rare earth concentrate as an initial step. But to date, it is unclear as to who purchases a mixed rare earth concentrate and the specifications required for such a product. 
So in our opinion, the industry outside of China, by a few major producers such as Molycorp or Linus, appears to be at an impasse. And it will take a couple more years, at least 8 to 10 in our opinion, for the rest of the world to regain the technical expertise that China has developed in this field. And given the military and technical applications of rare earth, access to these minerals will continue to remain critical. So just to end off, we have looked at three commodities which all appear on the critical commodities list of, of both the EU and the US. In each case, we have demonstrated that in general the commodity is controlled by a single producer or country. The commodity is critical to our future requirements with either technology or military applications or both and is characterized by periods of heavy underinvestment either due to environmental factors, low demand or prices, and have suddenly gained strategic importance as we've come into the computer age and the age of miniaturization and portability. We therefore assert that whilst these commodities are inherently subject to large swings in over and under supply and price volatility, they each present sound investment opportunities and they are backed, as they are backed by sound, sustainable, long-term demand dynamics. Thank you.